tonight. Do the terms left and right make sense in politics anymore? I'll give you some weird examples. It's January 26th, and this is The Ezra LeVant Show. This free episode of The Ezra LeVant Show is brought to you by... I am speaking to you at a moment of grave crisis, when violent and fanatical men are attempting to destroy the unity and the freedom of Canada. But after weeks of dangerous and unlawful activities, after weeks of people being harassed in their neighborhoods and small businesses forced to close, as democracy flourishes in Canada, we don't always agree, and that's okay. Because individual liberty is cherished in Canada. Our government will always defend freedom of expression and freedom of peaceful assembly. It has now been demonstrated to us by a few misguided persons. After evidence of increased ideologically motivated violent extremism activity across the country. Just how fragile a democratic society can be. It became clear that local and provincial authorities needed more tools to restore order and keep people safe. These are matters of the utmost gravity, and I want to tell you what the government is doing to deal with them. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act. The public's legitimate right to know why the government proclaimed an emergency and whether the actions it took were appropriate. It is our view that there was no justification whatsoever to invoke the Emergencies Act. It's just so tough to watch, there's no reason for that. They were literally running the horses through the crowd. The police came straight to me and he targeted me and he, he, ta he took his gun of tear gas and he actually shot me directly in my legs. Was it worth invoking the Emergencies Act, ma'am, to trample on the rights and freedoms of Canadians? Why do you think excessive honking means means that the government should strip citizens away from their rights. Our next and final witness is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Order a lot. Shame on you, you censorious bug. I'm conservative, of course I am. I used to be a member of the Conservative Party. In the next election, I will most likely vote for the Conservative Party of Canada, Canada candidate. But I, I really don't use the word conservative as much these days as I used to, because I don't think it fits perfectly to the pressing issues that face the world. And when I look around at the people who are often fighting the same fights I am, on the same side that I am, I notice many of them are not traditionally conservative. They, they would recoil at the word. Obviously, one of the examples I'm thinking about is the pandemic and the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates and other punishments like that. I've told you before my observation that people from all walks of life oppose those traditional liberals who would say my body, my choice when it came to abortion or, or drug use. They couldn't stomach now being ordered to take a government injection on pain of losing their job or access to public spaces. Labor union members who were appalled that their own union leadership sold them out to the bosses, accepting fundamental changes to the collective agreements without so much as a negotiation, let alone a strike. Green Party types, natural health types, just shocked that their own green leader was now a backer of Big Pharma. I mean, this little scene, taped right before the 2021 leaders' debates in our election, was just a perfect summary of the Uni Party. Am I right? We're all in this together. We've come so far in the fight against COVID, it's time to finish this pandemic for good. So get vaccinated. If you know someone who hasn't, talk to them. For our kids, for our communities, for our economy, it's how we get forward together. Vaccines are safe and effective for use. Vaccines are the best way for you to protect yourself, your family, and your community. So get vaccinated. Let's fight COVID-19 together. Pour vous protéger vous-même, pour protéger les plus fragiles d'entre nous, pour protéger l'ensemble de la population, le meilleur moyen connu demeure le vaccin. S'il vous plaît, soyez responsable, soyez solidaire, faites-vous vacciner. Merci. We all agree getting vaccinated is the way forward 
We're all in agreement this is not a partisan issue, so please get vaccinated. We're united, and it's time to get the shot. Vaccines save lives, they're how we're going to beat COVID, and it's time for everyone to do it. Get the shot. Get the shot. I acknowledge that they didn't specifically call for the vaccine mandate or vaccine passports, but that was where the vaccine policy debate was at that moment. It was about to get worse, including bans on flying or taking uh, trains or boats or whatever uh, for the unvaccinated in Canada. I was banned from flying for a, a year, as I'm sure many of you were. That video was from mid-September 2021, a month earlier the federal government had indicated that any employees under its power, as in federally regulated industries and government workers themselves, would be mandated to get the jab. And in the campaign, Trudeau, of course, said much, much more. Um, so how gross was that to have all five party leaders short circuit any debate and just agree? No wonder they conspired to keep out Maxime Bernier, despite the party being at 5% in the polls, the, th the threshold for joining the debate. I think Pierre Polyev is better on those issues than Aaron O'Toole, and we are out of the crisis, at least for now, but we can never forget how complicit the so-called conservative parties in Canada were on the abridgment of our freedoms and privacy, the federal conservatives under O'Toole, and even worse, provincial conservatives who were actually in power, including Jason Kenney in Alberta and Doug Ford in Ontario. So you see what I'm saying about the word conservative. But what makes me think of this more was my recent trip to Davos, Switzerland, to cover the World Economic Forum. It really is a caricature of an evil cabal of ultra-rich manipulators, Klaus Schwab, the supervillain, even with a German accent, and a Nazi father. Take, you know, he's talking about world domination. When I mention our names, like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin, and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But... Um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brez of uh, Argentina and so on, so that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are for our actually young global leaders of the world economy right. form. I've seen some conservatives laugh at that, saying, oh, he's deluded, he's just a braggart, that's nuts, that's just PR. And Klaus Schwab obviously is a braggart and a promoter and a hustler, but it's also obviously true. <clears throat> From prime ministers and actual royalty to leaders in finance and high tech and big pharma and big media, all sorts of green schemers, they really are there at the World Economic Forum and many of them pay millions of dollars for the privilege of, of being there. And, and his young leaders really do go on to run many parts of the world. And my point here is, isn't this what the left used to be against? When I was young and in conservative, and sorry, and in, in university and exposed to the organized propaganda of the left, so I'm talking 30 years ago in the 1990s, the left demonized what they called multinational corporations or transnational corporations, it was, a, it was an insult. They would spit those words. And there's two parts of that, the, the corporation part, which they hated so much, they even made a hit movie about it, implying that by nature, corporations were like a psychopath. That was the thesis of, of the movie. And of course, the multinational part was, was a shot at globalism or globalization, as they called it back then. So that was the left back then, denouncing big business, denouncing billionaires and billionaires who operate in different jurisdictions. The reason the left said they hated multinational corporations was that such companies, they argued, were in a race to the bottom. They would move jobs to the lowest paid workers in the world, so that, thus taking away good jobs from us and not just going towards cheap labor in China or wherever, but also weak labor, uh, weak labor laws, everything from union rights to health and safety rules and, of course, Multinational corporations sought out places with the weakest environmental rules. And finally, they moved their profits around to pay the least tax possible in whatever jurisdiction and, and don't even start on human rights. So those were the accusations of the left. And to be fair, many of them were proven true. But what the leftists didn't talk about was that 
that globalization was only made possible by consumers, customers who would buy something made in China because it was a fraction of the price it would cost if it was made in America or Canada. Over time, China in particular, but other poor countries too, became the outsourced factory of our world and also the outsourced pollution place in the world too. But it wouldn't work if consumers didn't want it. And obviously people vote with their dollars. All I'm saying is that those were the things that the left claimed to care about when it came to capitalism. Now they love big businesses and billionaires and multinational companies. How do they love George Soros, Bill Gates, Larry Fink of BlackRock? How do they love a big private jet secret of meeting in Davos, Switzerland? How did that happen? I remember the foreign policy narrative of the left when I was a student also. The CIA was the source of evil. It had toppled legitimate governments around the world and installed American client regimes. That's where the term banana republic came from, a reference to the CIA toppling third world leaders in Latin America in cahoots with the United Fruit Company, which is now called Chiquita Banana. I, I was told about the evils of American foreign policy with all sorts of intrigues from countries far away about which I, I knew little. And to be honest, I never really cared enough to investigate the veracity of the claims. I was skeptical. And if I had to choose between rival world powers, which at the time were, you know, at least before 1989, the Soviet bloc or the American bloc, obviously I would choose the democracies every time, even if they were getting their hands dirty in, in certain places. But my point is, there was a time when the left hated the CIA, hated foreign policy intrigues, hated what they called neo-colonialism or imperialism or foreign adventures. And now, well, talking about the CIA, all the big TV channels have actually former CIA officials, including even former directors of the CIA. They're literally embedded in the media. I remember the first Gulf War when CNN had reporters embedded in the U.S. military during the invasion. Now that's flipped around. The CIA is embedded in the media just to make sure they really follow the talking points of the deep state. And the left, they seem to love it. And it goes without saying that the left hated wars when I was a kid, especially wars in which the West, that is America, was a belligerent. It's not just the Vietnam era. It came pretty soon after 9-11 even. The number of anti-war movies I remember seeing in the early 2000s was staggering. I remember I went to the Toronto Film Festival back then, and it was pretty much nothing but anti-war movies. None of them did well at the box office, by the way. They were, they were all so bitter and obscure and radical. But being anti-war was big. There was a perpetual protest group called Code Pink that was against American war. They were active when America really was in wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I'm sure you remember, though, Donald Trump really put going to war on pause during his presidency. He didn't start any new wars. He quickly ended the war against ISIS by beating them. And he brought U.S. troops home from around the world. Still, weirdly, the left kept up their anti-war protests, even though there really weren't any American wars. Here's some gals protesting Trump, even though, like I say, he I think he's the most anti-war president since what? Jim, Jimmy Carter? Wood, Woodrow Wilson? Hey, guys, put down your goddamn guns. Hey, guys, put down your goddamn guns. I'm from Washington State. San Francisco, California. But we live in Washington, D.C. So tell me what brought you out. War brought us out here. We are with Code Pink, which is a women's peace organization. So we're at the RNC to hold Donald Trump and the GOP accountable for their hateful, racist, xenophobic rhetoric, which are the seeds of war and violence. Demilitarize now! Bust up war! Bust up war! So the left was against war when there was no war. But I'm pretty sure there's a big war going on right now in Ukraine. And I haven't heard a peep from Code Pink about it. Have you? Uh, I mean, I, I see just in the recent days that Germany is going to send their most modern tanks to the Ukraine, to Ukraine. And, and the U.S. is going to do the same. They're sending their ultimate tank, the M1 Abrams. And I think Canada is considering sending some of our tanks I'm just not sure how many of our tanks actually work, so I'm not sure if our military could keep that promise that Krista Freeland obviously made when she was at Davos or whatever secret meeting came up with the deal because she certainly doesn't put it to a debate in Parliament, does she? Like I say, the left 
loves war now. Isn't that weird? Now, I'm not a peacenik, but I, I don't think we should be cavalier about sending our soldiers to die or being happy about other countries doing so with their young men. And of course, the most heartbreaking victims are the civilians. And then there's the minor matter of engaging in brinksmanship with Russia, which may be weaker than NATO in conventional weapons. I think that's probably true. But I see that as actually a risk, not an opportunity. If Russia were to lose a war fought with tanks and men, and if we're, it were to be driven out, not only the land it seized in the past year, but also Crimea, which it annexed years ago, and and calls you know integral Russian territory now, surely Vladimir Putin would consider using nukes if he was going to lose that badly. His his government has said as much. Do you think what he's not brutal enough to use nukes? He's not desperate enough to use nukes? I, I mean, I don't know. Those are questions that the huge left-wing disarmament protests in the 1980s asked. But the left is positively excited by war now. It's odd to me. The left used to be for free speech, much more in the 60s and 70s, but still in the 90s they were. They loved Noam Chomsky, who was a kind of free speech absolutist, who also had a scathing analysis of the corporate media in America. He made a documentary called Manufacturing Consent, which was a cult classic for every lefty I ever met in the 90s. Uh, Manufacturing Consent talked about many things, but one of them was how the concentration of big media in the hands of a few media conglomerates homogenized the discussion in America and to an extent the world and basically ruled out or ruled in different ideas. He was worried about news monopolies. Here, just watch for a minute. So what we have in the first place is major corporations, which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. Now, like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. What keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember, we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates. And ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience that raises advertising rates. So what you have is institutions, corporations, big corporations, that are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what point of view would you expect to come out of this? I mean, without any further assumptions, what you'd predict is that what comes out is a picture of the world, a perception of the world, that satisfies the needs and the interests and the perceptions uh, of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Now, there are many other factors that press in the same direction. If people try to enter the system who don't have that point of view, they're likely to be excluded somewhere along the way. After all, no institution is going to happily design a mechanism to self-destruct. It's not the way institutions function. So they all work to exclude or marginalize or eliminate dissenting voices or alternative perspectives and so on because they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional to the institution itself. And again, there was something to it, of course. I mean, in Canada, for years growing up, you basically had the Southern chain of daily newspapers and you had the small Sun chain of newspapers and you had, what, three TV news stations dominated by the CBC and the same on the radio, and that was it. But where are those lefties now when there are just as few companies dominating big tech? Facebook, which owns Instagram, Google, which owns YouTube, and Twitter. And until Elon Musk bought Twitter, they all manufactured consent together about the pandemic for sure, but also about other things. And that wasn't enough. So there are now corporate and government-funded fact-checkers, which never check the facts of the establishment, only of the establishment's critics. Isn't that odd? And then there's the issue of feminism. When I was young, feminists were at odds with conservatives. But now the enemy of feminism is transgenderism, which is erasing women's places or even the definition of what a woman is after all destroying women's sport by allowing men to compete, putting convicted rapists in women's prisons if the rapists simply identify as women and absolutely smearing women who used to be heroes to the left, like J.K. Rowling, just atrocious. 
And I think of these things because I'm fascinated by the reaction to our World Economic videos, uh, our World Economic Forum videos from Davos. And I do see some thoughtful, independent leftists, true progressives, they found themselves agreeing with our videos, not just the BlackRock video, of course, but also the Pfizer video, scrumming Albert Bourla, the CEO, and the Greta Thunberg video too. Here's liberal comedian and pundit Jimmy um, Dore. Take a listen to him for a minute. How come you never protest Saudi Arabia or Russia? You only protest Western energy. Why have you never criticized Vladimir Putin or OPEC? <laughs> yeah, I've never done that. Never, ever. Well, will you do so now? Will you condemn OPEC energy? That's a super legit question. Will you condemn OPEC energy? Well, how do, how do, so how does someone n navigate that? She doesn't now, know OPEC what that is, it, is. Now, OPEC is in bed with the West. They're in bed with their, the petrodollar. They're propping up the United States petrodollar, which allows us to commit genocides and wars all over the world. That is the, the big, big pusher of climate change, the, the military. That's a completely legitimate question. And she just ignores it. Let's watch. Greta, can and, you condemn every... And then she starts laughing. Like, I'm sorry, you guys. This is fucking, you got a shitty spokesperson. Mm -hmm. You got a really shitty, this is your client. Do you think this is going to get it done on climate change? You think being acting like an, like a child, which is what she's doing. She's acting like she's 12 years old, not like she's 20 and responsible. She can't answer a direct question about climate change. Not one. Single delegate that's come here on a private jet. Surely that's something you should condemn. She won't. You can do it, too. I, well, I, she won't do it. Isn't that what is this weird? What kind of a weird back and forth is she? Ha this is crazy. But Jimmy is unusual these days. He's rare. He's a principled leftist of the sort I remember when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. 99% of so-called progressives today are weirdly cheering for Pfizer cheering for the war in Ukraine, like for the war itself. Forget about cheering for Ukrainians. They want the war, even though Ukrainians are, are the cannon fodder. They're cheering for the CIA. They're cheering for media concentration and censorship and cheering for all the things that the left said they hated when I was young. And that wasn't that long ago. It's strange, isn't it? I find myself sometimes more in league with principled leftists these days than I do with the so-called conservatives that want to swan about at Davos. Stay with us for more. This free episode of The Ezra Levant Show is brought to you by... Oh, hey guys, sorry to interrupt. I bet this interruption from me is kind of annoying. I mean, frankly, I don't want to be here either. I loved the show you're watching, and I'd be slightly bothered having some journalist pop in to disrupt my viewing. So if you don't want this to ever happen to you again and just have me or somebody else show up in the middle of your show, please consider becoming a subscriber to Rebel News Plus, where you will get early and ad-free access to incredible premium Rebel News content just like this. It's easy and cheaper than Netflix. Just go to rebelnewsplus.com to join today. Thanks. And back to the show. Well, the lockdown was a very strange thing socially. It stopped us from gathering. It stopped us from meeting. It shut down places of religious worship. It shut down gyms and bars and restaurants, shut down schools. Many workplaces shut down. But people found ways to create their own community. I think that the number of friends that I made during the lockdown was maybe the most friends I've made in any given year since I was a child at school because people found common interest, including fighting for freedom. One of the most interesting people I met during the lockdowns was someone I first discovered online making little TikTok videos. Here's an example of one of the motivating humorous, passionate, patriotic videos of a man named Palminder Singh. Here's just a flashback of how I met this man. Hey, one of you truckers. <laughs> Look at him, how excited he is to scare us 
and look how scared we are right so i think he's a good guy look at his face and at the amount of uh, stress he is going through right over here is his forehead so he's a good guy but he's reading the script they all are reading the reading the script these are all good people but they are under pressure all right we need to stand with them as well. and whoever writing their speeches they want us to get violent you know they using the words violence rights all the negative words right but what we are doing we all know that let's let's spread more love let's compound it to 10x come on man what are you talking about number players bank accounts come on people over there you don't know what they already you know decided in their heads don you cannot scare them with the no, threat of uh, noting their number plates and uh, you know bank accounts because we know we are standing for the right thing we are standing for the truth well i am lucky enough to have met that man in person and so have some of you who attended our rebel news live conferences in Toronto and Calgary, where he was a hit speaker. And I'm delighted to have Palminder join us again from his vehicle, as he did so many times during the lockdown, to talk about the one year anniversary of the trucker convoy. Palminder, great to see you again. And, you know, seeing you in your vehicle pulled over to do a video, that's sort of how the world got to know you a year ago, anyway. Yep, this is my studio. And thank you, Ezra. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, it's uh, such a beautiful, time of the year we were there in ottawa somebody was planning somebody was already on the way and here we are talking about it once again so thank you well it was an amazing time and it was so grassroots what i mean by that is it was authentic it was organic it wasn't created by some pr firm in toronto it wasn't funded by some political operation in ottawa this was ordinary people from different walks of life. And I think that so many people, it was the first time they ever did anything political ever. I mean, that's how it was with Tamara Leach. And I think that's how it was with you, right? Yep. Uh, I have. I was having zero interest in politics before the convoy. I, I wasn't aware of nothing like whatever these guys are doing. I had no idea. But after the convoy, you know that everybody knows all we do now is like uh, do comments or commentaries on their political stupid decisions and everything, right? So now we are fully aware of Canadian, not just Canadian, because of you, Rebel News, we are aware of the world politics. Well, it was, I, I really enjoyed your videos and I must have watched 30 of them. And I, I loved sort of learning about things along with you as you discovered different political stories and gave your opinions on it. I, I think people got a real kick out of it. And one of the things you said that I think meant so much to other Canadians is that when Trudeau denounced the truckers as racist or sexist, I'm trying to think of all the insults he made, you said, no, that's not true. And, you know, obviously I can tell from your beard and your turban that you're Sikh. And the fact that yeah. uh, Trudeau claimed that the truckers were racist, you and other Sikhs there, but not just Sikhs, I indigenous people, Black people, white people, people of every background, French-speaking truckers from Quebec. There were so many Quebecers. I think that you were living proof that Trudeau's attack on the convoy was false. Yeah, we know we know that from the day one. There, every single attack, it was all false. They was they weren't ha having any proof or evidence of it. Like he told the truckers, they're racist, they're extremist. They're misogynist. You know, we were there on the ground for three weeks. And uh, this morning I was talking about my another friend. He was from London. He was there in the convoy with his family. Another Sikh friend with the full grown beard and turban with his family. And he was like, I never ever felt that comfortable in Canada the way he was feeling in the middle of the convoy in Ottawa. And he was like, Every time I was going out there, having a bonfire together, everybody was coming, hugging him, even from Saskatchewan, Alberta, you know, from Quebec. So we felt that oneness for the first time, that unity. So racism wasn't even there, not even for a while. I wouldn't say it, it wasn't even there, like uh, the racism. It was the 
only main misinformation was being spread by Trudeau and by the mainstream media. I know exactly what you mean. I, I arrived and I thought it felt like, you know, sometimes when a city's hockey team wins the Stanley Cup, people just start honking their horns and celebrating and cheering strangers. Like there, there's that rare feeling that comes around like <clears throat> when, you know, at an event, like I, I think winning the Stanley Cup is the best example that comes to mind. But it was that way yeah. the whole time. And I, I remember people spontaneously singing, Oh, Canada. I never saw so many Canadian flags in my life. And it really felt special. It felt like everyone was in a friendly, patriotic community mode. I have to say in my yeah. whole life, I don't think I've been in that kind of a spirited feeling maybe half a dozen times in my whole life. And, and frankly, I'm pressed to think of a single other example right now. I mean, I'm not saying that's the only time in my life I've felt that way, but it, it's certainly the most community-oriented, mm -hmm. collegial feeling I can think of. I mean, may, maybe... Uh, yeah. You, it, it was just wonderful, I have to say. Like, it felt emotional. You, you, you just... Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I'm cutting you off. I don't want to forget this. <laughs> So I'm having goose goosebumps. I can literally feel in my heart like uh, beating, you know, out of love. You just remind me all those feelings. First time I felt those feelings, I was there. I'm an immigrant, right? I'm from India. So we were all the immigrant people. They always have this sense of belonging to back home. We always uh, discussing back home politics, back home issues. Nobody really cared about what is happening in Canada because... Uh, they just came here as an immigrant. They just want to make money and make home stuff like that, you know. So first time I felt uh, this Canadian feeling in the, when we won this Raptors game, you know, the championship. I was there in uh, Brampton downtown. So I was there watching the live game with my wife, with my daughter. And we were screaming. Everybody was laughing and uh, smiling at each other. I was like, wow, this is totally different feeling. So being Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. So then we won. Everybody was hugging each other. You know, you can feel that energy like you just mentioned uh, regarding the Stanley Cup, everything. We we experienced that, those feelings in the Freedom Convoy like every minute. The moment we enter Ottawa, I was like uh, standing out of the sunroof of our truck like f-150 yeah though i was like i'm feeling something in the air you know love is in the air like you cannot stop smiling you cannot stop laughing you know uh, out of love and everybody's coming hugging you and saying thank you and no and you look anybody into the eyes and nobody even uh, you cannot feel that they are strangers they're coming to you they're just hugging you and they're saying thank you thank you for being here so yes, it was a totally different vibration. Like you can feel love, light, peace and unity. Yes, it was there. And we experienced that for the first time. All, all the Canadians came together, even from Saskatchewan, from the villages, from the towns, from the cities, from Quebec, from uh, Canadian mountains, you know, from Alberta, from Ontario. Everybody was there. All the races were there. You know, we were sharing the same thing, the love, the light, the peace and unity. I'm still getting the goosebumps mm -hmm. by thinking all these uh, feelings here again. So thank you, Ezra. <laughs> well, you know, that's exactly Finding how that. it was. And yeah. in fact, the people that were full of sour feelings were Trudeau and his government and some of the hostile media. They were the mm -hmm. ones who were hunting for proof of malice or violence yeah. and that's what's so amazing is you had this these truckers hundreds of truckers thousands of people tens of thousands and there was not a single violent incident in fact they they were so peaceful they tried to create hoaxes and blame it on the truckers they were eventually all debunked i mean it, there were sour people there but it was the government angry that the people were happy there was hot tubs there was dance parties it, it were yep. bouncy cancels. Bouncy cancels. <laughs> yeah it was it was quite something now here we are a year later and mm -hmm. thankfully most things have gone back to normal i think the truckers and those who supported them should take a lot of credit for that because things were only going to get worse i remember january of last year mm -hmm. and you know there was the flight ban and there was uh vaccine passports and 
Trudeau was saying, should we even tolerate people who are unvaccinated? Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think things were going to get worse, not better. But the truckers sort of broke the broke the fever, and you and slowly, you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan dropped their vaccine mandates, and the Conservative Party of Canada got rid of their leader who was too timid, and suddenly things started to move. I think the truckers deserve a lot of credit for break, for bringing us out of the lockdowns and back mm -hmm. to freedom. I really think the truckers won the battle for freedom. Yes, they are they are our real heroes, not just for Canada, for world. You know, because uh, it was so tense a situation in the whole world, like what is really happening, what is going on. Everybody was confused. They were confused whether they should trust their government or not because they were getting these mixed information from the social media and mainstream media was showing something else. So once this freedom convoy happened, it sparked the flame throughout the whole world. We, we witnessed the freedom convoy in New Zealand. Uh, also, people started doing rallies in Switzerland, in Australia, in UK, in US as well. So yeah. yes, we spot these truckers, these, these Canadian truckers, they sparked this freedom flame throughout the whole world. So yes, they are our biggest heroes and we need to recognize them. We need to acknowledge them that that's, yes, they are our heroes and we should celebrate this anniversary every year. I know this year we couldn't do it in Ottawa on a bigger scale, but down the road, I know we are going to clean this mess and hopefully, I'm not just saying it just like that, we will celebrate this Freedom Convoy ceremony every year in Ottawa and we'll remember all the heroes, all the truckers. We will celebrate them. We will recognize them every year uh, in the history of Canada that these truckers, they stand against the tyranny. They changed, uh, changed the political viewpoint of people. They changed everything. Because of the Freedom Convoy, I'm totally a different person. Before I was ignorant, I I had no idea what idea what is going on in Canada. Now I'm fully aware. People are following me on Twitter. Almost all the Canadians who are related to this freedom movement, they know me and they they gave me so much love on TikTok as well. So because of the freedom convoy, even for my uh, uh, I'm in, evolving as a person every day. I'm giving full credit to the truckers, to the freedom convoy organizers, and to the Rabble News, all the independent news channels, I'm giving all the credit to all the people for changing my life for good, not just mine. In whole, all the Canadians, they are, they are associated with Freedom Convoy. And I heard these stories every day. Some, some people met there, they, they, they found their girlfriends, their boyfriends in the Freedom Convoy. Now they're becoming a family, you know. So there's so much going on that we don't even know, you know. You know me, I know you, I know a few people. But there are millions of people that they're saying their life have changed to totally after the Freedom Convoy. Plus, because of the Freedom Convoy, uh, they had to stop their agenda. They had to lift the mandates. They had to stop this uh, arrive camp. Thing, and they have to uh, lift, lift all the restrictions. Because of the Freedom Convoy, Canada is fully aware. Because of that, they couldn't, uh, bring, couldn't bring these mask mandates. They were trying their best to bring back in this winter. Maybe they were looking for another, another lockdown, because, but they couldn't do it because people are fully aware. Mm -hmm. Why people are fully aware? Because of the Freedom Convoy. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm giving full credit to all the truckers all the independent news channels like Rebel News and our Western Standard, whoever were there, were covering for the uh, real, showing the real truth to the people. And uh, now mainstream media, we all know that nobody really trusts them, of course, except 10, 15 people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? It's it's such a pleasure to talk with you again, Palminder. And we're yeah. going to put your Twitter and uh, other contact info under this video so people can follow you. I've, I mean, and that's how I started things off. They tried to shut us down and keep us apart, but we're not for the trucker convoy. I, I would never have met you. I would never, yep. you, you know, the lockdown, I would never have met some of the staff we hired here, like Alexa Lavoie. We met her at a protest in Montreal. So many great people came out of the woodwork and woke up 
and got involved. And it was a wonderful thing. And you're right, we have to commemorate that day, even though the current regime in Ottawa doesn't want us to. Palmetto, mm -hmm. it's great to see you again. Thank you for all your work for spreading freedom and your own enthusiasm for Canada and liberty is inspiring. Uh, and I, I just congratulate you for it and I thank you for it. Great to see you again, my thank friend. You. Thank you, Azra. Thank you so much. One thing I just want to add in the end, like I'm totally a different person. I'm not saying I'm a different. I'm the real Palminder now. And thank you, Canada, for bringing the real Palminder out of me. And I'm truly great, grateful for this. So thank you so much. Thank you, Azra. Thank you, Rebel News. Thank you, all the, all the Rebel News team. Thank well, you so much. Well, that's such a beautiful thing to say. Stay yeah. safe, my friend. Drive safe. And uh, I can hardly wait to see you again. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you so much. There you have it, Palminder Singh, a freedom activist who I met during the convoy. Stay with us. More ahead. This free episode of the Ezra Levant Show is brought to you by... Have you checked out the fresh new swag we have at rebelnewsstore.com? Like this nifty, resistance trucker sweater. We have warm, cozy sweaters, t-shirts, mugs, hats, phone cases, you name it. Everything to fit your freedom-loving needs or maybe even trigger a liberal family member or friend. And for a limited time, you can use code TAMARA10 at checkout to save 10% off of your total order. So head on over to rebelnewsstore.com, check out all of our new designs, make some purchases, and use code TAMARA, that's T-A-M-A-R-A, -A -A, 10 at checkout for 10% off your order. Head on over, check it out. Isn't Palminder great? Boy, uh, you know what? There's a guy who's got a big heart. Am I right? Here's some letters from you to me. Dwayne Christie says about the public order inquiry into the Emergencies Act. It wasn't a trial and there will be no consequences. As usual, it's the emperor's word against ours. We will have this joker for the rest of Canada's life as we know it. I would like to see a bill against coalition governments too. We didn't vote for NDP and this deal that gives them power is wrong. Alas, that is our parliamentary system. It's a different system entirely than the American system where you vote for a president uh, directly. We just don't do that in Canada. But I think you're right about your main point, which is he's going to laugh. He's going to shrug. Even if he is found to have had no legitimate basis for declaring martial law, who's going to do anything to him? His party won't. Joe Boudreau says, Ezra, while I did criticize you about your street interview with Greta Thunberg and Davos, I do very much applaud you for your reaction to CBC coming against you for your letter to Premier Smith of Alberta, my premier. You're still my journalistic hero in Canada. God bless you. Thanks, Joe. And I did read your letter about Greta. I'm sorry I didn't write back directly. You know, it looks tough when you're, you know, five foot nine, 200 plus pound guy asking questions of Greta Thunberg, who's five foot nothing. 90 pounds. She's so small. She really is like a child. But we have to be able to ask her questions, even though she's a little person. And I don't think any of the questions were mean or that rude. Um, it may have looked like we were swarming her, but we all gave her space. No one touched her. That's just sort of the nature of a media scrum. If you recall the very beginning of the video, she uh, was asked by her security guard, do you want us to walk with you? And she said, no, that's okay. And at the very end of the walk, she said, okay, guys, please leave us now. And everyone did. She even thanked us. So, um, yeah, listen, it's tough being a guy asking tough questions of someone who looks like a girl. But I, I have to say, I've probably read a thousand comments in relation to that Greta video. It's got so many millions of views. And fewer than one-tenth of one percent. I mean, like, I, I really, I think I only saw two comments saying, oh, you look like bullies or something. And there were people who just didn't like us anyways. I, like almost no one said that. So that's just on the Greta piece. On the CBC thing, Joe, thanks very much for your kind words. I feel good about that letter I wrote to Premier Smith. I have a rule of thumb whenever I talk to politicians. I, my rule is I don't say anything in private that I wouldn't say in public or frankly that I haven't said in public. Like, like I don't give private advice to politicians that's different from what I say in public because I, I wouldn't want my viewers to think I have some side deal or, or, or two points of view. And if you look at the five-page letter that I sent to the premier, 
It's really the arguments that I've made on TV for two years, but with some legal footnotes. You've heard me say the two standards for any prosecution to proceed in Canada. Is it in the public interest? And is there a reasonable prospect of conviction? You've heard me say that. You heard me say that in my on-camera interview with Danielle Smith. Actually, she said it. So are you surprised when I send a note to Danielle Smith, the Premier of Alberta, mentioning that? There's nothing in that letter that's a surprise, and I'm proud of every word of it. And the CBC reached out to me in a way that made me think they were going to try and do some gotcha on me. It wasn't as bad as I had feared, where their story that came out was a bit of a nothing burger, but they're so desperately trying to dislodge Daniel Smith. It's sort of pitiful and sort of obvious. My only worry is that some people actually get their news from the CBC and actually believe it. Uh, I know that's not a large number, but it's large enough. Well, that's the show for today. Until tomorrow, on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, to you at home, good night, and keep fighting for freedom.